In the days and years and centuries of the before times, generation after generation of enslaved black people learned to be careful when they sang about freedom. We mean freedom in the next life, not this one, they'd say regularly, just in case anyone was listening and they often were. They knew those they knew as masters and misses, the people who enslaved them, never caught on though to the truth that they were already and always making their way to liberation. Although most of us were taught that enslaved black people were freed by proclamation from President Lincoln on January 1st, 1863, it was actually a long road between that pronouncement and the reality. A reality made possible more often than we realize because of the resistance and the resilience of black people themselves. To start, the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation actually only intended to free slaves in Confederate states, which meant about one million people were still legally enslaved. And of course, just because you declare something a law does not mean everyone will actually follow it, especially in the very states that had just declared they were seceding. The real end to slavery took more than two years and over 600,000 lives, many of them Black people who enlisted in the Union Army. When Paula Cole Jones led our eighth principal workshop this spring, she reminded us that the world changes when the story we tell ourselves about the world changes. Change the story, change the world. The Civil War had been over for two months and 900 days had passed since the Emancipation Proclamation, but the westernmost Confederate state of Texas, the story there was the same as it ever was. Until finally on June 19, 1865, Union troops made their way to Galveston with a new story to tell. There they announced that the 250,000 still enslaved black people in the state were free. With a few words that were finally then backed up by the power of the Union's army, the word they had known, the world they had known for nearly 250 years was gone in an instant, and a new world was there in its place. Change the story, change the world. 30 years later, Booker T. Washington tried to describe what this world changing moment was like. He writes, there was great rejoicing and thanksgiving, wild scenes of ecstasy. My mother, who was standing by my side, leaned over and kissed her children while tears of joy ran down her cheeks. She explained to us what it all meant, that this was the day for which she had been so long praying, but fearing she would never live to see. In an instance, reality was radically transformed, which is not the same as saying that freedom was suddenly accomplished. After all that time, some slave owners, you might guess, refused to let their slaves go for months longer until they were personally, individually forced by Union soldiers. And for Black people, there was an entire psychology to learn, a new language for their bodies to speak. The freedom so long caught in song was real, here, now. Not to mention they learned, needed to learn a whole new set of life skills. As Washington also wrote, the questions of a home, a living, the rearing of children, education, citizenship, the establishment and support of churches. It is hard to imagine where they could even begin. 
Even more, Juneteenth did not bring with it a parallel sudden shift in the beliefs and culture that had for so long sanctioned slavery among white people, that caste system that we've read about in Isabel Wilkerson's book in recent months. 165 years later, we are still trying to tell ourselves a new story. Did you ever think there might be a fault line passing underneath your living room? A place in which your life is lived in meeting and in separating, wondering and telling, unaware that just beneath you is the unseen seam of great plates that strain through time and that your life already spilling over the brim could be invaded, sent off in a new direction, turned aside by forces you were warned about but not prepared for. Shelves could be spilled out, the level floor set at an angle in some seconds, shaking. You would have to take your losses, do whatever must be done next. When the pandemic first took hold, when so many of us were lost in our homes, negotiating new routines and safety protocols, and others of us were told we were essential, but then sent off to work without sufficient protection or understanding in those days, on the first Sunday, all online, we read this poem I've just quoted from Fault Lines from Unitarian minister Robert Walsh. We knew then a small version of the reality altering earth shift that swept across the country from that emancipation proclamation in 1863 until the ratification of the 13th amendment in 1865. Our fault lines were marked by fear and uncertainty, the taking of losses, the doing of whatever must come next rather than the joy and jubilation of Juneteenth, but we too learned what it meant for everything we'd known to be true to change in an instant. We were disoriented and unsure if and how things would change back. I remember there was one moment in, in April 2020 where I actively wondered if this degree of anxiety and isolation that I was experiencing was now just the equivalent of real life because I suddenly realized it was starting to feel normal. But then, in these last few weeks with the availability of vaccines and the most recent guidance from the CDC, once again, we find ourselves sitting on a fault line. Of course, it is true that this is not the end of COVID. Vaccinations have stalled and kids under 12 are still not eligible. And yet the world as it has been the last 15 months is radically transformed again. We are here again, trying to sort out what to trust, what is changing and how much. If this is now real life, as we've been asking this morning, then what was all that? Unlike 15 months ago, however, many of us greet the spilling shelves of today's fault lines with glee and rejoice at the idea of finally being sent off in a new direction. Some news articles are noting how similarly people are greeting this summer to the early days after pro prohibition was lifted, a time that also followed a global pandemic. People piling into bars and around musicians, releasing themselves into the pleasure of human bodies, moving together once again and claiming a renewed freedom without ever looking back. I mean, literally, you may remember a few months ago, I spoke about how that Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 was for some time known as the forgotten pandemic. And maybe now we understand a little more of why. In today's revelry, the urgency to return 
feigns ignorance when it comes to the continued presence of the virus, regular and variant, shrugs off the staffing shortages many businesses are experiencing, and often disregards the exhaustion and grief that many of us are carrying after a year of being not isolated but overworked and afraid. It is a practice this quick urgency of return, this revelry that is wedded in a certain way to amnesia, disconnection, refusing to retain that most pressing lesson of the pandemic that is our inextricable interdependence. And also it is understandable and to be expected. Maybe it is especially American. Maybe it's just human but none of us automatically know how to end well. Especially we do not know how to end something traumatic or painful well. I mean, just think of all the ways we, that we have tried to forget rather than finish the story of slavery the perpetual urgency in our culture to just move on, now played out, still being played out over 156 years. We do not, as a people, know how to surface lessons learned. We do not know how to describe the shifts that we've experienced, how they've shaken us, the ways that our stories and the stories of those we love have changed, the ways we have changed. And we do not, without coaxing and care and a constant presence of courageous love, know how to acknowledge what has been lost or what has been revealed. For all this, we need teachers and elders, friends and counselors, guides, people who can come alongside us and hold us accountable to going slow. Remind us to care for ourselves and others in this great transition and invite us to stay with it until the actual ending comes. Left to our own instincts, we often skip over the ending and leap ahead, or rather we leap back, wanting to get back to how things were before. The ground before it started shifting, before when we knew new things, before when we had a life that was real or instead we might cling now to this world the ending one unwilling to let go of the here and now that has become a new normal this impulse just as a little aside as it relates to the pandemic that you know the impulse to just keep staying quarantined isolated it now has a name people are calling it cave syndrome Maybe you or someone you know is experiencing cave syndrome. Now, even though I know that there is no, never a way to go back to the past, we and the world are always and already changed. You can see it in, in that those visualization exercises. We and the world are already changed. But despite all this, I get, I get the instinct. I get that simultaneous longing to just go back, whatever that means, and also to just stop everything from changing ever again, that weariness of constant adaptation, wishing that we could just for a moment hold. Maybe you get it too. In a recent podcast with healer, teacher, and somatics practitioner, Prentice Hemphill, the writer Priya Parker says that while we cannot hit pause on the world around us, the instincts to go slow through this transition can be a great way to intentionally close this time and to companion each other through this ending. Parker, whose work focuses on helping people have complicated conversations about identity and vision at moments of transition, invites us to take this time, this round of the world shifting, again, to consider a whole host of questions, starting with the simple one, or maybe not just simple, what happened? 
I mean, what has this time been? And then going deeper, what happened in this time to our sense of place, to our sense of family? What happened to our sense of ourselves? She invites us to consider who and what did I miss? And who and what did I not miss? What did I learn? What did we learn? What do we still need to learn? What was lost? In what ways did I become lost? And then how did I become oriented and find my way? In what ways was I newly found? What was revealed about myself to myself, about my relationships, about the world that I live in, about life itself? And then what do these revelations ask of me and of us now? Remembering that as we change the story, we change the world, what is the story that we will tell about this time in the many years to come? What is our story of change? And then how will we live into that? We'll be sure to share out this list of questions in our Monday email. I hope you will spend time with them. Talk about them with the people in your life and with others in this church. And if you're interested in sharing some of your story with me or helping us collect other people's stories and reflections, I'd love to hear from you. If you've been pretty regular on Sundays this last year, none of this should feel entirely new. We have tried to weave a regular practice of ongoing reflection over the last few months so that we might arrive here to this moment more willing to go slow and to close well. And also so that many of you might now also be those teachers and guides for those who have not, for whatever reason, been as present this year as we begin to reconnect and reweave our stories in the coming months. Going slowly in this transition, taking time to reflect and allowing us to close this time well, will set our emerging future on a foundation of healing rather than avoidance and amnesia. It's a countercultural move. Going slow through this transition, taking time to close well, will allow us to leverage the beauty of this time to help us imagine what comes next. And there has been so much beauty. Doing this with others and with each other in accountable community allows us to weave together who we were before, the pre-pandemic reality, with the experience of the last 15 months, all of our answers to these questions so that we can let it all sink in, digest it all until we know it all as our story, our lives, this community, our world, all changed and changing and all of it, all of it is real and all of it counts. Maybe so. And amen.